Good morning. I'm Pete Daly, CEO and publisher of the U.S. Naval Institute, and thank you all for joining us for this first event of the American Sea Power Project. When we envisioned this project about a year ago, a key part of our thinking was to take this conversation from the pages of proceedings to the stage of the Jack C. Taylor Conference Center. And while this first page-to-stage event is being done virtually, we hope to do these in person and soon. The end of the Cold War lessened the urgency for in-depth thinking about maritime strategy in the United States. During the past three decades, naval planning and force structure were guided more by budgets, technology, and land operations than by maritime strategy. With the return of great power competition, however, there is a need to get back to strategic thinking about what it means for the United States to be a maritime nation and how naval power underpins national power. From time to time, it's vital that we revisit the foundations of maritime strategy to evoke the clearest thinking. And without a common understanding and clarity on the ends we wish to achieve, we will not make the right decision on ways and means. I would like to thank especially retired Navy Captain Jerry Roncolato and retired Commander Paul Giara, who brought us this idea for the project and who have played a significant role working with proceedings staff in shaping the topics and recruiting authors. Today, you'll hear from Jerry and Paul, who wrote the first article in the series, and Naval War College professor Jim Holmes and Dr. Nick Lambert. Jim Holmes's article, Great Responsibility Demands a Great Navy, and Nick Lambert's What is a Navy For are both foundational articles, and I'd wish I'd been able to read them when I was a junior officer. I hope you had an opportunity to read each of their articles as well and watch the opening remarks which we released over the last few days. If not, all are available on the American Sea Power Project webpage. The most important part of this project, however, is not the articles themselves, but the dialogue they engender. As we have done since 1873, the Naval Institute's providing the open forum for frank, professional discussion and exchange of ideas. We want to hear from you. And we invite you to read, think, speak, and write as part of this dialogue and share the articles in this dialogue with your Navy shipmates, fellow Marines, Coast Guardsmen, your family, friends, and fellow citizens. The United States faces extraordinary challenges right now, both at home and across the globe. The sea services underpin the nation's security and economy, but Americans need to understand what's at stake and that freedom of the seas and unhindered global commerce are not free. Thank you again for joining us today. If you're not yet a member of the Naval Institute, I encourage you to join us and support this kind of content and programming. And I'll now turn it over to Bill Hamblett, Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings, who will moderate the discussion and will leave time at the end for audience Q&A. Please use the Ask a Question tool on your screen, and we look forward to a lively debate. Thank you, Admiral Daly. Greetings, everyone, from Annapolis and the Media Center of the Naval Institute's new Jack C. Taylor Conference Center. I'm Bill Hamlet, Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings, and I'm thrilled to be with you today to moderate this conversation. Before we begin, uh, just a few housekeeping items. For tips for the best viewing experience, please visit the handout under the resource list. An on-demand version of this webcast will be available tomorrow and can be accessed uh, using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. Okay, let's get started. With us today from Northern Virginia are retired Navy Commander Paul Giara and Captain Jerry Roncolato, who envisioned this project and wrote the first article in the January proceedings. Professor Jim Holmes is online from the Naval War College in Rhode Island, and Nick Lambert's joining us from his home near Philadelphia. We've all had a chance to read their articles and watch their introductory videos, so we'll get right into the Q&A. I have a few questions to start us off, and then we'll get to audience questions. I'll start with Paul and Jerry. You argue, argue that a rigorous debate about naval strategy is necessary. Why? Well, thank you, Bill. Uh, good morning. Um, first of all, there can't be enough thinking about naval strategy, maritime strategy, and American sea power. It, it's simply too important, it's too central to so many 
key geostrategic, national security, international, and and local issues. Uh, so there can't be enough of it. But there's been a break. There was a clear and conscious break with the organization and thinking about these issues at the end of the Cold War. And so um, it, it occurred that uh, the Naval Institute, after all, has a heritage of this kind of dialogue and debate. And then it became fairly obvious that this kind of thinking should recenter, uh, at least at first, at the Naval Institute. And that's sort of why we argued for this. Um, I would add that <clears throat> there's a, I think, a predisposition in, in the naval profession to focus on types of ships, numbers of ships, weapon systems, propulsion systems, and so on and so forth. Uh, and that has worked well for us for a long time. Even during the Cold War, you had, uh, you know, if, if the Soviets built a cruise missile, we built a better anti-missile missile. Uh, and so it was a kind of a, a improvements on the margin. What we're facing now is a fundamental change, not just in, in technology uh, and, you know, kind of our societal and fiscal realities in the United States, but most importantly, geopolitically. And as every you, you see everywhere the return of great power competition, so on and so forth. And given given the remarkable changes that have occurred since even since the end of the Cold War, and even more since the end of World War II, the last time there were major United States involved in major at sea combat operations, um, you have to. We believe you have to go back and start at first principles. And to us, uh, a lot of the the strategic documents that have come out of the Navy over the past 20, 30 years have been basically pronouncements from uh, from CNO or from the you know, on high uh, Joint Staff, Secretary of Defense, and not a lot of uh, skin in the game for, for the deck plate sailors, Marines, and, and Coast Guardsmen. And so we think that, that there are a lot of ideas out there, number one. And number two, it's, rad it's, it's fundamentally critical that we start this process of exploring and competing the ideas in an open forum to to make sure the best and most tested ideas raise, rise to the surface. Hey, let me add one thing, Bill. Uh, I agree with everything Jerry said. Uh, we were separated at birth. Um, the uh, This doesn't mean necessarily that it's a clean sheet of paper, that so there has to be, and, and the, those thinking about this have to consider what has changed, but also what hasn't changed. And so this is, and this is not an easy thing. It's sort of an unnatural act to, to think back. This is not nostalgia that I'm talking about, though. This is critical and objective uh, thinking about history, and, and what hasn't changed is as important as what has. Great points. Uh, next question is for Jim Holmes. Jim, your article makes the point that the United States has taken on such significant global responsibilities that it must have a great Navy. So uh, devil's advocate question here, why not a great Air Force or a great Joint Force? Or perhaps why not scale back the nation's responsibilities to a more affordable level? Hey, Bill. Thanks a lot, and it's uh, it's it's great to be with everybody today. To take your last question, and to take your last question first, I mean, uh, scaling back our global responsibilities is always an option. I mean, in fact, you hear it uh, quite a bit out of the what the what the people on campuses, generally speaking, and sometimes in Washington, will call offshore balancing, namely, namely the idea that the United States should pull back from some of its global commitments, and and then and then maintain the capacity to go back uh, should we get into a crisis. So that's always an option. I mean, that's a, and that's one, uh, Paul, Paul and Jerry did a great job talking about debate, but the, and, that, and that was much, very much on the, on the military and naval level, but up on the grand strategic level, that's all, that's always an option. You can, you can reduce your commitments and thus reduce the, the resources that you put into, uh, to gain them. Wouldn't be, that wouldn't be a, a course of action that I would advise, but, but, but again, that's, that's, that's part of the national debate. Uh, to, to to go back to your first question about uh, about why not a great air force? I mean, there there is absolutely no question that we inhabit an age of joint sea power that that brings not only the navy but also the, and the marine corps and the coast guards, which which are taken to calling themselves the naval service singular, but also but also our our friends and our friends in the U.S. Air Force and in the U.S. in the U.S. Army and so forth. 
any any implement whether it's uh, whether it's sea based or shore based that can influence events at sea is an implement of sea power so in a, so in a sense you, you could actually almost retitle my article uh, great responsibility demands great sea power to, regardless of which service uh, actually supplies it given that before i before i uh, be quiet though I, w I would say that the navy ultimately is 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 the is the service that's going to end up carrying military power and safeguarding commerce in the rimlands of eurasia which is primarily what the united states wants to influence it has it, it has that kind of staying power it, it it brings it brings marines it brings firepower and so forth to those shores so that the united states can try to influence events there so ultimately ultimately the navy is, is still at the center even though we even though it's a wonderful thing to see the army see the air force and the other services actually uh, uh, think, thinking about how they can support, support events at sea. Having, I haven't got an Air Force or an Army officer to, to, to sign on to the idea yet that they are maritime services when they're operating in the saltwater domain, but it's a, but I think it's actually really true. And, and, and on the deck plates, or, or on the whatever you want to call it, you actually, you actually see it uh, happening before our eyes. So it's, it's a great thing to see the, the services embrace their maritime past when you look back to the Pacific War and, and, and try to revivify that for the current age. Thanks. Yeah, great points. Uh, next question is for Nick Lambert. Nick, uh, your article, What is a Navy For?, talks a lot about economics and Alfred Thayer Mahan's observations from the first great period of globalization. Some might argue, uh, on the contrary, that navies just exist to sink other navies. So why do we need to go any further into our thinking? Uh, well, good morning. Um, I would say that's a rather uh, one-dimensional view of looking at the subject. Um, such a combat-centric outlook reduces sea power to some sort of, I don't know, gladiatorial contest. And sea power is much more than that. Um, and, and, and such statements would probably are, uh, prompt me to ask people, um, what is your objective in sinking these enemy warships? You know, presumably, it's to achieve sea control, which, of course, is a legitimate operational objective. But to what end? You know, assuming you manage to assure, uh, to secure sea control, which is by no means certain, what do you propose to do with it? You know, sea control does not automatically convert into victory or the immediate end of the war. Uh, to accomplish that, you've got to apply decisive pressure somewhere upon your enemy to bring about peace on our terms. And that is usually done, invariably done, through economics. And that was Mahan's conclusion. Um, and so... When you think in terms of sea power, you need to look at the bigger picture, you know, to think in terms of strategy and national policy. Great point. Uh, I'll go back to Paul now. You've done a lot of thinking about the sociology of the U.S. Navy. Can you share some of your observations with us? Sure. Um, first, obviously, I'm not a sociologist, but I think that, that what the Navy is about at this level of strategic thinking and conceptualization is a very social enterprise. So I'll start with being very social. I want people to disagree with me. I want people to say, no, that's not right, because what, what we're trying to do, of course, is engender debate, engender conversation, and engender value-added conversation. Um, and please also, again, socially, uh, please understand that I'm not being gratuitous, gratuitously critical when I make some of my comments. I think the U.S. Navy is different than other navies. It's global, it's forward consistently, it's constitutionally mandated. Maintenance requires constant attention and great expense. These things have to be explained. They have to be justified. First, they have to be justified internal to the Navy. The Navy has to understand, as Nick Lambert said, what a Navy is for, but more to the point, what the American Navy is for. And the American Navy has a particular character that bears constant explaining and justification and rationale. Uh, the second is that the Navy has to explain itself and socialize with the country at every level. Men on the street, uh, congressmen and congresswomen who are going to pay for all of this, has to, ex to the media, has to explain itself why it proposes to do what it's going to do. And also, let me add that this is part of the exercise where the Navy is not just supporting, but affecting the national strategy. I believe that the Navy has played a role in that regard and has to continue to do so. And finally, it's particularly important that the Navy explain itself both to its allies, 
uh, and onlookers, but as well as potential opponents. It's increasingly important in today's uh, period of, of unrest and challenge that everyone understand quite clearly what the Navy is capable of doing and what it intends to do. Now, obviously, some of those conversations have to be private, but again, as a sociological thing, as an entity, it has to be expressed clearly and definitively to uh, everyone who's watching, uh, external to the United States as well as national. So who's going to do this and how is that going to be done? This is part of how the Navy is going to organize to think about these things and to articulate its conclusions. Goldwater Nichols has been an undercutting influence in this regard and in this effort. Uh, but I've reviewed Goldwater Nichols. Now, I'm not a great legislative expert, but my reading of Goldwater Nichols is that it gives responsibility for strategic planning to others. That's true. It gives responsibility to the Joint Staff, to the COCOMs, to OSD, and so on. But it doesn't, at least not explicitly, take away that re responsibility and, in fact, authority from the Navy. So this raises the issue in sociological terms, an inartful way to express this, obviously, but it raises the issue for the Navy of whether and how it's going to do that and who's going to do it and how to organize for it. Now, the break in, in stride that I referred to at the end of the Cold War had one particular effect. The Navy literally and formally disestablished its strategic planner subspecialty. I know because I was one and I was I was taken aback when that happened. Um, so uh, it could be that one of the first things the Navy is going to have to do socially, internally, is to make sure that this particular enterprise of strategic thinking is resourced, that it's managed, that it's supported, pushed forward, uh, and that there is a cadre of officers to, to do these kinds of functions that will return time and time again to the effort so that they are not only well-informed and, and perhaps self-selected, but they are experienced and they understand how these relationships, internal and external work. And finally, I would say that this, this brings to bear the concept of who is going to be the primary spokesman for American sea power. In my way of thinking, it's ineluctably the chief of naval operations, that the chief of naval operations not only has to sponsor this effort and this cadre and manage it quite personally, but he has to be the primary, in the literal sense, spokesman for American sea power, which again is quite different than sea power as practiced by any other country, except perhaps you could argue that the Brits as our as our forebears. So this is terribly important that the Navy get a handle on how it's going to organize uh, so that it can effectively socialize internally to the Navy, externally to the country, and then subsequently externally to the rest of the world. All right. Thanks, Paul. We've got uh, about 35 questions already from the audience, and hundreds of people have uh, logged on today, so this is exciting. We'll go to some of the audience questions now. Uh, so the first one I'm going to read is from Bernard Cole, uh, Bernie Cole. We all, a lot of us know him from uh, uh, his work at the National Defense University and uh, books that he's written, uh, particularly about the Chinese uh, Navy and the PLA uh, buildup. So his question is, one could argue that the U.S. has had only three maritime strategies, the Anaconda Plan, War Plan Orange, and the 1980s Maritime Strategy. All of these occurred in response to existential threats to the United States. For any of the panelists, I'll throw this to, uh, to Professor Holmes just to start. Uh, do you think that there's a current existential threat driving the necessity for a similar maritime strategy? Hey, bud, glad to hear from you. It's been a while. Uh, you know, I think that, I think that's you know I think I would actually uh, lash this back to what Paul and Jerry were just saying when talking about the sociology of the U.S. Navy and expand that out to the to the nation as a whole. And I, I think that I think that part of the conversation that the CNO, as, as as Paul was just talking about, needs to carry on with the country to to make the case for American sea power is that there is that there is a, a pressing a pressing threat. 
I mean, I mean, think, if you think about uh, what American national existence is, we think we, we are a seafaring nation. We obviously we obviously are a, a leading guarantor of uh, freedom of the sea and so forth. Does our national existence actually come into question without the ability the ability to control the seas for commercial and military military purposes? It's uh, it's uh, I think this is more like. The, you, you listed two two, two uh, strategies that were actually rather unambiguous. The first, the first two, the last one, I think, is probably the, is probably the one that is the is the most pertinent to today because today is a lot more like the Cold War when we're not when we when the the Cold War has not gone hot. The, the competition with China has not gone hot as of yet. Even in secondary theaters, we saw the Cold War go hot in a couple of secondary theaters uh, over over the term over those four decades. But so therefore, so therefore, that makes it a pretty difficult uh, communications challenge for CNO, for whoever the spokesman for American Sea Power are, to make that to make the case that these things actually are critical to our existence as we as we know it, to uh, to our to our aims and uh, that we hope to accomplish in the world and so forth. So again, I think that I think this is the, this is I could not agree more with the ability the, uh, to Paul's point that we need to carry on a, a, an ongoing conversation with the country. Just one, one quick anecdote that I think relates to Bud's question. That from uh, in the closing months before I came back to Newport in 2007, I was I was uh, on the faculty at the University of Georgia. Back when the Navy was carrying on what they called the conversation with the country in the run up to the 2007 maritime strategy. I was probably the most maritime-minded person in the entire state of Georgia, perhaps outside of uh, Kings Bay, the, the, Navy, the Navy enclave down in the southeastern corner. I did not even hear about the conversation with the country and, until long after they had come to Atlanta, held, 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 the, held an event with business leaders and, and so forth, and had gone. That I think that that I think, and that's just a personal anecdote. But I think that speaks to to the need to mount sort of such a sustained conversation to make to, to make the Navy's case, to make the Marine Corps' case. That, that that this is actually something that is really critical and not just something that's nice to have. So I think I think we're at the beginning of a, of a difficult pathway. But uh, yeah, great great question. Great question. I think the answer is yes. But is that? But that's still a hard thing to to communicate. Short of, short of something really dramatic like the American Civil War, which you mentioned, and like the Pacific War, which you also mentioned, where, where you have a Pearl Harbor, you actually have shots being fired and so forth. That kind of drama concentrates public attention. Uh, more ambiguous strategic competition like the Cold War today doesn't necessarily. Thanks. Hey, Bill. I, I'd like to add uh, one thing to that, which uh, Jim just kind of touched on at the end there. Uh, and Bud, greetings. Good to good to hear your question. Um, the, the question is, is: Do we face an existential threat? And the challenge, I think, given the the lag time in building sea power or any military power, especially sea power, is it, the question is: Can the United States uh, develop and maintain effective sea power before it becomes an existential issue? The bumper sticker question is: Do we need another Pearl Harbor to to get us get us the country, not the not the Navy necessarily, but the country as a whole, moving in that direction? And that that's the problem with, you know, the I think I think the you know, the the future perhaps presents an existential threat to our uh, if not our territory, our way of life in the global order. Uh, we can argue that, which not not here, but I think the Navy needs to think about <clears throat> that potential and come up with the answers to it, because that's what we get paid for. B Bill, may I add one thing very quickly? I know you're trying to get on to the other questions. Uh, thank you, Bud, for the question. One way to sort of organize thinking, perhaps consensus about this, is to consider what the, the fundamental American national strategic policy has been since about 1940. And that's to uh, preclude or or defeat the rise of inimical despotism in Eurasia. Since the, the December of 1940 fireside chat, that's what we've been doing. So one way to explain this is that, well, here we are again with the Chinese. And that kind of brings it back to, OK, now I kind of know how to think about that. In that context, I would I would offer that the maritime strategy of the 1980s is a pretty good starting point that that it brings the kind of approach and, and thinking and and action that is pretty applicable to now as as Jim Holmes has mentioned there's a lot of similarity between the Cold War 
and now. There's an argument about terms. Is this a Cold War, a nuclear war? Not? That's not the point. The point is that we are faced with the same challenge from China that's quite similar to what occurred. We're in the earlier stages of it that occurred with Japan and Germany first and then with Stalin and the Soviets. So, the, again, the 80s maritime strategy is looking pretty good in my view. Can I, add, can I add just one more thing, but just, just to Shane on to what uh, Paul was just saying. I mean, when you think about uh, public communication strategies, I, by no means do we want the United States government to become the Chinese Communist Party. But yeah, but, uh, but I think it's actually worth looking at how the Chinese Communist Party makes the case for, for Chinese sea power to the Chinese people. I mean, they, they, folded, they, folded, they folded the case for a big PLA Navy and supporting shore arms and, into what they call China's dream. I mean, this is something that uh, Premier uh, Xi Jinping talks about every day. It's, I mean, it's something that's really young, encompassing, and sea power is part of it. So I don't know. I don't know if we want to go back and start talking about the American dream and the maritime component of that. But I think that. But I think there is something. There is something to be learned from the Chinese approach, uh, not to not to mimic it wholesale. But I think that. But I think the uh, th thinking about fashioning a public narrative. I think Beijing is actually onto something. Thanks. Yeah. This next question comes from John Hanley. I'll I'll direct it to Nick. Uh, and it picks up on that, uh, the, the comment that you just made, uh, Jim. How does the U.S. remain a preeminent naval power when it is a third-rate maritime power, considering our merchant and fishing fleets today? Well, I, you don't necessarily need, need to possess American-flagged ships to participate in the global trading system. And um, is the United States a maritime power in the sense that it uh, it actively possibly participates in global trade? Yes, unquestionably. Um, is there an advantage in having an American flagged merchant marine? Probably there are, but at what cost? Uh, so uh, I really can't say much more than that. Okay. Uh, I'll take the next question is from uh, Eugene Golda, and uh, this one goes to, to Jerry. There's criticism about focusing on designing the next ship, the next weapon system, next fleet, et cetera. How can we wait to do those things while we have a discussion on the strategy, on the ends? Can it be done in parallel? Uh, that's a great question, uh, and I, I think absolutely. I mean, whether it can or cannot be theoretically, practically, it's happening. There's a there's a there's a large debate on both sides on, on maritime strategy and sea power. It's, it's the Naval Institute. It's other entities, uh, and, and you know, Naval War College, for example, just ran a, a, a maritime strategy in the 1980s conference. So there's a lot of churn on this, and you see you see congressmen like like Luria uh, Gallagher, uh, Whitman, and others uh, engaged very heavily at. at at a conceptual level as well as as a construction level, uh, our our point is that there's you know there's a certain in, uh, momentum behind the shipbuilding program, for example, now, and there's uh, great arguments by uh, people like Brian Clark uh, arguing for uh, optionally manned uh, platforms and distributed firepower. Uh, that's that's great stuff, but you you, you can't. My our concern, my concern is. You cannot do that in isolation. It's not enough to tell the American people, and nor is it enough to tell American seamen, Marines, and Coast Guardsmen that we we know we just need a better destroyer, and so just sit down and color while we build a better destroyer. You have to go back to what is what is the what is the desired end state of peacetime engagement, of deterrence, and of war fighting in hard, concrete terms, and those have to take place in the context of historically-based maritime power theory. Uh, in, the, in the early 20th century, late 19th century, uh, the American naval officers, as they contemplated this, you know, that we had the War College coming online, the Naval Institute was there, we were, we were contemplating becoming a great power, a global power, and the questions were being asked, wow, since, since we did this in 1861, 1865, there's been a remarkable amount of technological change. The global map has changed completely. The United States is now continental power. Uh, what, how do we how do we get a footing to understand how all these changes combine to change the character of war that we might be expected to conduct? 
in their answer, uh, as, as John Haddorf has argued, their answer was to turn to history. My concern right now is uh, the, the naval community's answer is to ignore history and thereby ignore theory because they've been so fo they're so focused on the technology. In other words, today we say that technology's changed, the map has changed, uh, conditions have changed, character wars changed, therefore history is irrelevant. That's exactly 180 degrees out from what, what was being argued at the turn of the last century. And not by everybody. I mean, there was a whole cabal of naval officers who, who didn't agree with that. They didn't, they, they, they were, some people would call them the material school that, that focused on engineering and weapons and, and, and that is absolutely essential to sea power and naval power in particular. But it, it, the context has changed so much, we can't just focus on the, 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 the stuff we like to talk about, ships and airplanes and buses and trains and things like that. Great. Uh, there's a, a number of questions that are coming in from uh, overseas audience. I'll, I'll throw this one out to the group, whoever wants to tackle it. This is from Will Evans, Pembroke College, Oxford. Uh, he says, thanks for your excellent articles and presentations. Can I ask about the importance of partners and allies to the U.S. Navy today and going forward? NATO provides a bedrock in the North Atlantic zone, but what about the Indo-Pacific? Is enough invested by the Navy in allied relationships to be militarily useful. May I address that? No. Yeah, I, Paul, I know you worked a lot with the Japanese allies during your career. Um, yes, and uh, given what I think are some of the constants, in particular, for instance, the geography of the Rimland in the Asia Pacific, um, the US Navy going forward, this is my personal analysis, is going to have to um, contest for the first island chain, in the first island chain, with the inhabitants of the first island chain. And, and I can't think of a stronger rationale for strong allies, uh, for strong alliances with strong allies. Uh, you see this playing itself out, although uh, with agonizing slowness in some cases with Japan, for instance. Uh, uh, Indonesia seems to have taken a greater interest recently in, in naval armaments, things like that. Um, the, the location, it's, it, this, this campaign is kind of like real estate where the three most important words are location, location, location. And so um, given that, the alliance aspect of this is crucial, not to mention that the U.S. Navy can't do this uh, for the most part by itself, at least under present circumstances. So there's both the, the, the location rationale and the, and, the, and the collaboration rationale that are key to this issue of alliances. Great point. Yeah, I'll just, I'll go. Oh, oh, yeah, just, to, just, to, just to agree with Paul, I mean, the, <clears throat> what is America's strategic position in the Indo-Pacific without allies? There, is, there really isn't one. So we, we actually, we actually have to uphold our alliance commitments in order to, in order to sustain our position off the, off the rimlands along, along the first island chain. So that's point one. I mean, we need to, we need to, we need to convince our allies that we can and we will keep our commitments to their security, to their prosperity, all, all the commitments that we've taken on over the last uh, few decades since the Second World War. So it's, so it's actually, it's actually critical that we do that. Well, I would actually, I would actually cheer on the Marine Corps, which actually, it would actually, actually hasn't come up yet this morning. But actually, I think, I think leading the leading this effort under the leadership of General Berger, talking about stand-in forces. I mean, if you think about what stand-in forces, forces that remain stubbornly within the Chinese uh, weapons engagement zone. That's nothing more than a, an effort to, well, not only to, to, to deter China and also position ourselves to win should we get in a, to, in a fight with China, but, more, but I would actually say more importantly to show our allies that we will be for them, or we will be there for them. Uh, we, will, we, will, we will actually help, our, help uh, ourselves in the process, leverage the uh, geographic advantages of the United States and its allies, and on and on. I mean, it's, it's really hard, to, it's really hard to, to bound the advantages of alliances that, uh, that, uh, that, that are available to us in the Indo-Pacific, as well as the downsides if, we, if, our, if our allies lose confidence in our ability to do that. So, 
it's one, it's one reason I, I, I like the, the current administration, the new administration has sort of dropped the, the, the sort of transactional approach to alliances, suggesting that our commitments to our allies like uh, Japan and South Korea and so forth are perishable if they don't contribute more to their to our presence in the, on their soil, then somehow we're going to scale back. I think that's I think that's exactly the wrong approach to take. So I'm glad to actually see us reverse course on that uh, that aspect. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, next, next question comes from uh, a proceedings author, Lieutenant Kyle Craig, uh, who asks, uh, with respect to sea control, Dr. Lambert discussed, is there a is the goal of sea control viable when land based long range precision strikes can reach out thousands of miles at sea? Nick, you want to take that one? Sure. Um, it really depends what you mean by sea control, I suppose. Um, sea control, it seems to me, for an awful lot of people, seems it's assumed to mean you can do exactly what you want at sea. I mean, sink, take, burn, anything that you don't like, look off. What exactly do you mean? What do you suppose to do with sea power? Um, you would have to define the term sea power a lot more close or sea control a lot more closely uh, for me to be able to answer that effectively. Um, I, 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 that's a good answer, Nick. I would, I would add that if you, that sea control has, you know, strategic, operational, and tactical aspects to it, uh, because we are challenged tactically uh, you know, on, a, on a broad basis doesn't mean, or even operationally, if you want to say it that way doesn't mean that, that sea control can't be attained in certain specific areas to support certain specific missions. Uh, I think uh, the United States in particular has gotten accustomed to the fact that we have sea dominance, sea supremacy, if you will, everywhere. And we are planning our thinking, our education, our outlook all resides on that or rests on that. Uh, the, the era is coming when that is no longer going to be the case. So the issue becomes... Uh, you know, the seas take or sink. Uh, I love that, Nick. That's great, great phrase. Uh, is to what, again, to what Nick said earlier, to what purpose? And, and, and what will it take to do it to support a given effort? So, for example, in the first island chain, uh, back to the Allied question too, if, if we don't have alliances and partners in, in, the, in that region, then we don't, the, the first island chain becomes a whole different concept. It's a Chinese bastion that we can't penetrate. Uh, likewise, if, if uh, an ally is facing a challenge, either directly or indirectly, militarily, or some other element of national power, and we can't exercise some degree of influence, which in turn relies on some level of sea control, uh, then we we aren't going to be effective. Nick, did you have something else you thought of? I, I mean, I would say I've been thinking about it a little bit more. And I'd say, first of all, sea control is normally assumed to be a term that applies to uh, for combat navies in time of war. But sea control has a commercial meaning as well as a military meaning, and it has a peacetime meaning as well as a wartime meaning. And um, so I would um, for first of all, I think that needs to be recognized. And uh, you know, the normal state of thing is actually peacetime, commercial. So what do we mean, you know, it, it, going back to the original question, what do I, what would uh, sea control look like? Surely it would be the free flow of commerce, unfettered and unrestricted anywhere in the world. That would be my broadest definition of what I would mean by sea control. And that is surely the highest objective. Yeah, I'd say, I think the way to think about this is to go back to the works of Corbett, and in particular, who hasn't come up yet this morning. Let me be a professor for a minute. But I mean, Corbett, uh, my hand seems to suggest that command of Z is on or off. You either have it or you don't. Uh, Corbin, I mean, he, he he does a great job laying out different degree, uh, different degrees of, of of sea control, and suggests what you might be able to get done with various. Uh, and of course, we're talking about in a war con wartime context, which is what he wrote about. Uh, so that's a little different from what uh, what Nick's been talking about. But uh, you could almost call it Fifty Shades of Blue if you wanted to. <laughs> the the Corbettian the Corbettian approach to sea control. He goes he goes so far in his in his book uh, Some Principles of Maritime Strategy to suggest that sometimes in wartime you might have to exercise sea control without actually owning it. 
So it's, it's so I mean he really he really takes it to the nth degree and suggests that uh, you might be able to get done what you need to do, what you need to get done what you need to do without without actually uh, commanding the sea whether it's uh, and so he talks about permanent general control which is basically Mahaney in command all the way to, all the way down to not owning the sea at all but yet just still trying to do amphibious raids or whatever you might be able to do without actually commanding the, the sea in the, in, the, in, the, in that little bubble that you need to to to, to actually provide that enabler to do what you want to do strategically and politically so kind of kind of a neat kind of a neat reference to go back to if you want to get some traction on these uh, on these topics Nick, do you have to add or can i make a point oh go ahead paul yep um first i want to flag the point that this question was asked by a navy lieutenant this is exactly the point of the american sea power project and it's no surprise that uh not only did he ask the question but that he's a Naval Institute often. So that's the first thing. The second thing is he gets at the the intersection of aspirational versus practical. And it and and it, it's I think the I don't want to speak for the lieutenant, but it raises the point of how successful the Chinese have been at telling us and everyone else that we can't do any longer tactically, operationally what we set out to do. And so their anti-access area denial strategy posits that we're not going to be able to do that. I think we can do that. And I think that this is not the first time we've been confronted by an A2AD strategy, after all. And that, in fact, many of the capabilities that we need are in hand. Stealthy ships, for instance, that have virtually non-existent acoustic and, and thermal signatures. Um, the potential for bottomless magazines required uh, to uh, defend against uh, anti-ship missiles. Things like that are in the toolkit now. They are the state of art, if not yet quite the state of practice, and are going to answer the question of whether the aspiration is possible. And this is an important conjunction of these two things, aspirational and practical. Thank you for the question. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I'll uh, throw this next question out from Sebastian Bruns. I wonder if one of the participants wishes to speak to the role of academia in the American Sea Power Project. What's the what's the research agenda? Is there a role for professional military education for the Naval War College, Naval Academy, postgraduate school, PhD dissertation projects, et cetera, medium and long term? So I'll let. Uh, in fact, I, I'm going to ask uh, Jim if you want to take that on, and then uh, as a Naval Institute guy, I'll, I'll tack on at the end uh, as well. Hey, Sebastian, great to hear from you. It's been a while. Again, it's, 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 it feels like we're getting in a band together this morning with all the vo voices out there in the maritime world. I mean, the, the quick answer to your uh, question is no, no, no role whatsoever. I mean, academia has no has no part to play at all. No, I mean obviously, I mean we, play, we 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 we're great believers in the ability of professional military education, not necessarily to direct things like PhD process processes, but but to make them possible. One thing one thing that with the War College in particular has done has done in recent years is to start up a maritime history center, uh, sort of coupled with the naval the naval history center down in Washington D.C. and make those archives av available to PhD students as well as any, anyone who's uh, interested in doing research on that. But as far, as far as the larger role that academia, especially especially military education, actually plays, uh, we've we've talked a lot about history and about strategic theory and so forth. I mean, that's 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 we provide that uh, basic grounding to to mid to mid career and senior military officers in in hopes that they can actually go back out into the real world, where, whether it's the Pentagon, if that's the real world, or out into the fighting forces, and thus and thus be able to to deb debate on these matters on an equal footing with with their with their uh, scholarly their their civilian colleagues who actually do PhD studies and so forth. So that's a, that's the that's the idea at least. Also on the also on the research side, obviously, uh, gaming gaming has found a new heyday in, in recent years as we've started to get our minds around. Uh, our minds around strategic competition with China, with Russia, with 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 pick your favorite competitor. So, uh, I think Jerry Jerry mentioned more gaming a few minutes ago. They're, they, those people are very very busy over in McCarty Little Little Hall over here in Newport, and I'm sure the same is is, is true elsewhere and elsewhere in the military as well. So, yeah, it's a, a, a great a great question, but uh, yeah, obviously obviously we, we we're true we're true believers in this in the in the contribution that education can make. From the Naval Institute perspective, I'll just add 
there's not a formal, we haven't formally teamed up with NPS or the Naval Academy or the Naval War College, but you can see, you know, represented here that we reached out to uh, experts. So Professor Jim Holmes is the J.C. Wiley Chair of Strategy at the Naval War College. Upcoming authors are other experts on national security strategy, naval strategy. We've got uh, John Lehman coming up this fall with uh, one of the articles uh, for the project. Uh, but back to the point that Jerry made, a, or sorry, Paul made a couple minutes ago, that Lieutenant Kyle Craig is part of this conversation as a proceedings author. We're taking all comers for this project. We want all the ideas, and as Proceedings has done for you know almost 150 years now, it's an open forum. It's you know we, we want petty officers, we want admirals, we want retirees, we want uh, academics, we want everybody to be participating in this, uh, and uh, you know testing each other's ideas against each other. I guess is one way to put it. So um, there's a number. Of make one quick point. I think that this, again, is another intersection between the sort of theoretical and educational and the practical at the p &E institutions like the Naval War College. So first of all, here's a practical suggestion. How many students go through the Naval War College? Many of them are required to write a paper, an operational paper or a strategy paper. This, I, I personally believe that the Navy should be very carefully directing, monitoring, and, and extracting from that effort useful ideas. That's the first thing. The second thing is a little critical. Uh, I think that wargaming is gonna be hugely important and most in the past, very, very important wargaming, not all of it, but very important wargaming has happened at the war colleges. Until we see the wargaming center operating around the clock, seven days a week, it's pretty obvious that the Navy doesn't have its heart in that effort. There are, we're up to a hundred questions from the audience now. So we're obviously not gonna to get to all of them, but what I'm seeing are, are some trends or some themes that are uh, coming out from multiple different uh, members of the audience. One of them gets back to a, a point. So in Nick, in your paper, you made the point that the Navy has not made a great case for itself to the American public. Paul, a few minutes ago, you mentioned that you're thinking that the chief of naval operations needs to be the the chief um, salesperson, if you will, uh, for the United States Navy to the to the country itself. Um, and uh, we've got Tom Cutler, who is a longtime uh, Naval Institute member and also uh, press author, you know, has brought up this point: who should be the the person or people? who are helping to sell this idea, the sea services, to, the importance of the sea services to national security, uh, to the American public uh, writ large. So I'll throw that question out to you guys. Are there some ways that perhaps the sea services can better uh, sell, their, their, sell their importance uh, to the American public, get the American public to understand what happens to uh, their economic well-being, if you will, uh, if if they don't fund the Navy, if they don't fund the sea services, the Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard, to uh, the level that are, are needed by the you know the, the current global situation. Nick, you want to take that one? Uh, sure. Um, well, yes. I mean, my position is that I think the Navy is rather taking for granted what cannot be taken for granted that they're going to have the funds available in the short to medium term to do what they think they need to do. Um, right, yes, you say sell the idea of sea power, but first you need to define the idea of sea power. I don't think there is any clear understanding of what exactly the Navy is for and what it can do. I'm not convinced by what I've heard. and I'm the most sympathetic person you're going to find. So if you're asking me to dig into my wallet and give uh, more money to the Navy, I want to know what, what it's supposed to do, what it's, what it's for, um, you know, how, why. Um, you know, what Bill mentioned, uh, I think, touches upon uh, really what I want to hear is, uh, and I think what most people want to hear is, how does the Navy affect their economic well-being? How does it benefit them? Um, and again, I just go back to what I just said, is from what I've heard so far, 
I haven't heard anyone explain why I should basically dig into my wallet and give the Navy more money. Um, I, to add to, Nick and I have on occasion talked about that. Um, I think Nick went away. Um, there he is. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, you might have to turn off your. Uh, you got two things on, Nick. He's closed. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, to add to add to what Nick Nick says, uh, clearly the Navy, I believe, <clears throat> in the Navy's case, as General Berger's doing with the Marine Corps case, the Navy needs to articulate why it exists, why the why the people of the country need to pay for it, what the impact of more Navy or less Navy is on their lives. That's not to say that articulating that's going to have any direct or immediate impact. Uh, there's the, the nation is fairly well uh, uh, focused on internal domestic issues, and for uh, over 30 years now, at least, has been able to to assume away what's going on internationally uh, and assume that our 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 apparently God-given right to have to be the top dog in the world is going to continue so that we can focus on domestic issues. And that, my argument is that that period is coming to an end, that, that there are, if not existential threats, then there are, there are challenges out there that are, are going to compete against our idea of what the global world order should be. And we either, as Jim mentioned earlier, we either step up and say, no, we're going we're gonna to push our own, or, or yeah, okay, it's time for us to sit back. And there are arguments, even amongst NATOists, to say, well, this is kind of hard, so we should just step back and, and let China have the Western Pacific. Uh, it's, you know, just like we were trying to get the Western Hemisphere in our early days, let them have the Western Pacific and all will be well. Well, you know, there's significant differences, the most prevalent of which, of course, is Nick's argument, is that, you know, in a globalized economy, Every region of the world counts, and every region of the world contributes. So, so I think part of the, the the Navy needs to make the statement, and it needs to be broader than just this is this is what we're doing uh, in terms of personnel, in terms of shipbuilding. It, it's what is our purpose, and that needs to be continually reinforced and stressed and and, and made clear in every venue that the Navy. Active duty Navy, retired Navy uh, spokespeople are, are going out saying, uh, at the in engagement with Congress and the administration, and to have the dialogue out there so that it's it's it becomes a we we make the argument that the world is changing and the American prosperity and security rely on sea power in all its all its dimensions. That needs to be be said, and it's not. And, and maybe like like in the late 1930s, with everybody focused on depression and isolationism, uh, and and growing, you know, uh, changing political dynamics. We President Roosevelt did everything he could to get us positioned for when the inevitable came that we were involved in this war, and still we we were surprised. Okay. That's that's what it is. But the two things the Navy can do is articulate what what the Navy is for, what sea power is all about, the American people. And the other thing, which hasn't come up, which is not part of the, the ends piece of the discussion, is the Navy's focus, internal focus on war fighting and evolving doctrine and thinking about the type of warfare we're going to end up in. And what does that mean for personnel, recruitment, training, education, bureaucratic organizations, the whole enchilada, uh, it, it all has to be revised. And none of that can happen if you don't have some rethinking of the strategic purpose against you know, maritime history and so on and so forth. Let, let me give two practical examples of how this works. Um, in November of 1940, Franklin Roosevelt was reelected for the third time. That gave him the political uh, flexibility to start the buildup in earnest of the American military <clears throat> that preceded our involvement in World War II. And then it was clear that, at least to Roosevelt, that, that our involvement was going to be unavoidable. I think that, that 
all involved from the president on down have that political latitude now to do what we're talking about. So that's one thing. But the second thing is an example from two weeks ago when the CNO was on camera. You can watch this. It was at the Center for American Security. And the session was touted as, was titled as uh, the future of American maritime strategy or something like that. Maritime strategy future. That was the premise of the discussion. I challenge you, because you can see it, you can re re recover it from the CNAS website, that not only the topic, but not even the word strategy was brought up. And there seems to be, unfortunately, this aversion to articulating and explaining and talking about these subjects at the level that Jerry has just alluded to. It's just not just doesn't seem to be happening. And this is not good thing, obviously. I'm sorry, uh, amazing conversation. I'm mindful of our time. We've got time for one more question. And, and I'd like to bring a Marine Corps question into this. So this question is, uh, it's for Dr. Lambert from Daniel Rogers. Uh, he says, Mahan could hardly have imagined the growth and expansion in the mission of the Marine Corps. What might he think to be the proper role of the Marine Corps in this era of globalization, too? I'm not inclined to answer that question at all. Telling Marines what to do. Uh, I'm not Sorry, Nick, we're getting some reverberation here. Yeah, Nick, make sure you have two windows. Make sure your the, the uh, uh, media player window is closed on the right hand side. Okay. Yeah, no, I, can, I, can, I, can, I can feel that one. If you, <clears throat> excuse me. I can feel that one if you want to. I've been doing some work with the Marine Corps War Fighting Lab. With the, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, think that, I think it's actually a, a less a Mahan question and more a, a Corbett question. I mean, you hear the Marine Corps talking about using light, light amphibious craft and so forth from move to, to, to move from island to island and, and contribute to sea control and sea denial as an extension of the fleet. And I think so. I think that's a, that's very that's very much a Corbettian idea that the, the fleet and land forces are uh, are interdependent. And I, it's, it's it's great to actually see that the, the Marine Corps take that on. The Navy and the Marine Corps seem to be simpatico on that as well. So I think that's a, I think that's something that would I think the question is actually well founded because I think this this is something that uh, that would have been a little bit outside the Mahanian framework, but it, but it's very, but would be very comfortable to Corbett and and other theorists who understand that wars are ultimately settled on land and therefore naval forces need to work together. Uh, to, to actually control the sea in order to help uh, settle, to settle things on land. I think what we're seeing is the cyber attack on Nick, so he can't participate anymore. I think so. I think so. Sorry to hear that. Uh, but we are out of time. I wanted to thank our panelists today uh, for first for writing for proceedings. Your articles were fantastic. Uh, and then showing up today for this uh, great conversation. Also wanted to thank uh, our virtual audience for attending today and asking questions. We had 121 questions overall. Obviously couldn't get through that many in an hour. Uh, but thank you very much for uh, for tuning in and being part of this conversation. Uh, we will continue this conversation on the pages of Proceedings in the coming months. The next author in the American Sea Power series is Seth Cropsey. His article, America's Broad Purpose on the Global Stage, will be in the May issue of Proceedings. Uh, the on-demand version of this webcast will be available tomorrow. Uh, please share it with your shipmates, fellow Marines and Coast Guardsmen, your family and friends, and even national leaders. We need to get the news out of this project, but especially about the importance of sea power. Until next time, please remember victory begins at the Naval Institute. Have a great day.